My name is Blake Barclay, and I'm the chair of the John F. Kennedy Jr. For, uh, Forum, our student committee. I'm here zooming in from my home back in Pensacola Beach, Florida, and welcome to, to our inaugural FAST Forum, our new series for conversations with prominent public figures, including elected officials, journalists, and activists. While we can't be here together in person, technology is allowing us to convene virtually, and bringing FAST Forums online allows us to share Harvard University's mm -hmm. premier arena for political speech, discussion, and debate across states and countries while we are remote for the remainder of the semester. And for that, we are incredibly grateful. Now, please join me in welcoming our moderator, uh, Mr. Mark Guerin, Guerin, the director of the Institute of Politics at the Harvard Kennedy School. Great. Well, thank you, Blake, and thank you for your uh, leadership with the uh, forum committee. And good evening uh, to all our students that are joining us and friends of the IOP. Um, from around the country. Uh, we hope this finds you safe and healthy at this uh, rather unprecedented time. And for those of you and family members and friends who are, are suffering at this time, we expend our special thoughts and prayers. This is, um, this is a heavy time for our nation and our world. And it's a time where especially I'm proud to be part of the Harvard community and the Institute of Politics, where so many of our students and certainly our graduates and faculty members are really working hard to make a difference. Um, so we welcome you this evening. As Blake said, we're starting this fast form, which is a 30 minute program uh, and with questions, certainly from the students and those gathered uh, remotely in this way, where we invite elected officials, political activists, journalists, um, those really engaged in politics and public service uh, as is our tradition at the JFK Junior Forum. Tonight, we turn again to the topic of uh, the coronavirus. At our last in-person forum before spring break, uh, our topic was the coronavirus, where Rick Burke uh, moderated an excellent panel with one of his colleagues from the STAT and faculty members uh, from the Kennedy School and the School of Public Health. It was a sobering and important uh, conversation. And tonight, we continue uh, that topic of um, COVID-19 and how the effect of the virus may be impacting our democratic institutions. And we have two outstanding panelists. Congressman Jim McGovern is a Democratic Congressman uh, from Massachusetts. He's represented the Worcester area since 1996, and he is the chair of the very powerful Rules Committee in the Congress. And Latasha Brown, who is well known to those of us at the Institute of Politics. She was a re resident fellow and led a a very important study group and was very engaged in the Harvard community. She's the co-founder of Black Voters Matter and is a leading national expert in organizing. So we brought them together to have this conversation about the impact of uh, COVID-19 and what it means for democratic institutions, literally from how the U.S. House of Representatives is going to vote and whether they should vote remotely or how they will do it given the uh, global pandemic that we're in the midst of and how it will affect grassroots organizing in elections uh, from the primary season uh, to potentially into the fall. So we're very grateful to Congressman McGovern and to uh, our great friend, Latasha Brown for joining us uh, for this fast forum. So with that, let me begin with Congressman McGovern um, who uh, I'm hopeful joins us uh, from- Can you hear me? Yes, hi Good. Jim. It works. That's right, the, the power of technology. I hope this note finds you well in the nation's capital. And thank you for your own public service. Um, but let me, if I could, jump right in, because uh, this is a fast form and your schedule must be extraordinary, given your responsibilities in the House. And as I said at the outset, we're, we're wanting to consider our democratic institutions, uh, given that the United States Senate voted 96 to zero yesterday on this important package. Four senators were absent, uh, and the House will vote tomorrow. But Speaker Pelosi commissioned you uh, to give a report to your Democratic caucus as the chair of the uh, Rules Committee. And you have really been the point person in the House of Representatives to consider these issues. Uh, Seventy of your colleagues wrote to you and said there should be remote voting. Mm -hmm. uh, and you produced a thoughtful report commissioned for the Speaker uh, with your recommendation that we should uh, go through this rather extraordinary time in House voting uh, with what is called unanimous consent. So could you speak to us about not only that, but the mood in the Congress, how this virus, how this pandemic is affecting 
the very act of voting in the Congress with your historic vote tomorrow? Well, first of all, uh, I'm glad to be with you. Hope everybody's safe and well. Um, you know, uh, I mean, this is unprecedented. Um, and um, members of Congress are back in their districts. Some come from states that are in a lockdown right now. Um, some members of Congress um, have, uh, you know, not only preconditions, uh, pre-existing conditions, but they have super duper pre-existing conditions. And um, I've learned a lot about that as I was working on this report. Uh, so it would be very dangerous for, the, for, for them personally to be able to travel um, during this time. Uh, so, um, you, know, uh, you know, one of the, one of the problems is that um, we don't have a system in place for remote voting. Uh, over the years, uh, various committees did, has, have done hearings on them and, and they've always kind of concluded that they're, it's too problematic. Uh, one is, I mean, technology keeps on advancing. So, you know, the last time these hearings were held, uh, technology wasn't what it is today. But, um, you know, there, there are constitutional issues. Um, some constitutional scholars say there, there are none. You know, the con con Constitution talks about Congress gathering in one place, not communicating like this. And, um, but I think they could probably be resolved. Uh, but then there are logistical issues, um, and then there are security issues. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, technology isn't perfect. So, I mean, if we did something like this for debate and vote in Congress, you know, if the Russians or the Iranians or the Chinese wanted to mess around with us, they could block this, some of our communication and kind of uh, make us look incompetent. Um, the second thing is that we have members of Congress, some who are very technologically advanced, some who are not. We have a lot of members of Congress who still have used flip phones. Um, and uh, so this technology is a very intimidating thing for many of them. So there's a learning curve here. We're not quite there. Um, and, you know, one of the things I pointed out is that if we were to just all of a sudden start with something like this um, and, you know, you had members of Congress who, who couldn't get connected, what are the rules of debate when we, when we communicate like this? Uh, you know, and there's a whole bunch of questions. You know, it, it, you know that would all be on C-SPAN and would look pretty incompetent. Now, we have to solve this. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and I think what, what we need to do is uh, once this crisis is over, uh, you know, figure out how we can plan for another situation similar to this. I would also say this, the rules of the House do not at this present time allow us to remote vote. So, and, and there are divisions in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party about what to do. So we couldn't get a unanimous consent uh, agreement just to change things. Um, we would probably have to have a vote. So people would have to come back and vote on the change. So it sounds simple, but it's complicated. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And so the vote tomorrow will be by unanimous consent. Well, we hope. Um, so uh, we don't know. We have we have a couple of members um, who are threatening to demand a roll call vote, uh, which means that we we have to try to bring some people back here, um, and you know enough so that um, you know if there's a roll call vote, we have enough. We have a quorum. We have enough people here to be able to pass the bill. I hope that's not necessary. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, the Senate passed this thing 96 to zero. I mean, uh, you had, you know, conservatives like Ted Cruz support it. And you had liberals like Bernie Sanders support it. So I don't know why the hell, you know, anybody, uh, you know, would want to uh, mess things up tomorrow. But uh, unfortunately, a couple of members are talking about demanding a vote, which is unfortunate because it means at this moment that we need to call some members back. Uh, and uh, again, you know, in this era of social distancing and you know, and, and trying to be very, very careful, getting on airplanes and gathering together. And, you know, it's not, we're not practicing what we're preaching. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Latasha, let's bring you in, into this conversation. You've spent your life organizing for important causes and you led a great study group here at the Institute of Politics where you made the point that good organizing requires and knocking on doors and holding events and talking to people and, uh, rallies. So in this age of social distancing, as Congressman McGovern says, uh, we've heard about it, how they're handling it in the United States Congress. How do you feel the impact of this will be? Obviously, we're already delaying primaries. And how do you see the effects of COVID-19 on our, our very basic citizen engagement and civic participation? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it 
it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I know the ones in my study group and those that know me know that I always um, start an anchor even before any of my talks with song, because I do think it's important, even in this moment, for us to recognize this is really about humanity and that we're in the center of this. And so as we talk about these processes and the things we have to do, we've got to be centered that we're talking about human life. And I wish all of you all well that are watching this today, you and your family's wellness. And so you're right, Mark, you know, my entire life, what I'm known for is organizing on the ground that um, ultimately in the last, um, last few years with Black Voters Matter, we created our infrastructure in the field. And so what does that mean? What that means is that, um, part of what is good organizing is being able to be flexible enough to really respond to what you have to work with in this moment. And so what does that look like and what does that mean? And, you know, I, I think it's really important for us to recognize that even in the midst of this crisis, while it's really important for us to address the financial issues and the financial crisis, it's also, you know, democracy delayed is dangerous, right? And so we have to be just as vigilant around protecting democracy in this moment. Matter of fact, I believe even more so. And so I think it's really important. We're eight months out from the general election. What we do know is that even the constitution that on January the 1st, that seat will be open, right? Regardless, right? And so um, unless there's some kind of, um, um, there's some kind of amendment to the constitution, but ultimately we've got eight months and we really have to expand this conversation around in some of the states, like many of the states I work in the South, absentee ballots and, and voting by mail is not necessarily an option or it's a bar there's barriers with that. So there should be conversations right now around what does it mean for us to expand the vote? Um, what does it mean for us to really expand having the equal and fair access um, to the vote right now, whether it's absentee ballots, whether it's early voting, what are, really be able to think about what we need in place, because eight months is not a long time, particularly in a campaign season, like that is not a long time. I think it's important for us to really talk about expanding, how we expand access to the ballot. Also, how do we protect and the health and safety of folks? And we know that a lot of the people who work in the poll, polls, particularly the poll workers in the states that we're in, they're older and they're advanced in age. And really being able to be mindful around, we're going to have a big gap in poll workers and people that can work the polls. So we're going to have to be creative this election cycle on that. In the meantime, as it relates to organizing, it's as we've done right here, that we, yes, we go to classes, go to the forum, but what we've done, we've had to move this virtually. So a lot of our organizing, we've also had to move virtually. We're doing virtual town hall meetings. We're sharing information. We're using technology to leverage on the things that we do on the ground, which is connect to people, be able to give them information, and how do we build a network? Thank you, Latasha. I did not introduce you as a jazz singer, but you proved it very beautifully here. Thank you for sharing that. Well, we have a good start with the Congressman's Reflections and Latasha's. Let's, as is our tradition with the forum, go out to uh, our audience virtually uh, with questions. Uh, they've queued up in line with raising their virtual hand and Luke Albert will be the first questioner. Luke, we invite you to identify yourself and your affiliation with Harvard. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Hi, uh, my name's Luke. I'm an undergrad sophomore at the college. Um, so my question is actually somewhat of a two-parter, I apologize. But one was, how can we make these uh, emerging uh, emergency voting reforms like universal vote by mail uh, permanent policies all across the country? And which do you two expect to successfully become permanent policies that we see going forward with our elections? Great. Thank you. Great question. Do, Jim, do you want to start? Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. Um, uh, look, um, I think we, uh, one of the things we're we were trying to do in this package that we're going to vote on tomorrow uh, is uh, basically um, allow for or, or, or require uh, mandatory uh, vote by mail all across the country. Um, and we wanted to put enough money in there to do that, given the fact that we have no idea how long this uh, crisis is going to last. Um, and we are very concerned, you know, that uh, it, it could last into the next election. We already have states canceling primaries. Uh, and in uh, some states, by the way, are more advanced than others in terms of uh, vote by mail. But uh, we, 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 ought to, we, we ought to 
again, in the spirit of prevention, uh, be putting the money in there to, uh, to give the states the resources to do that. We tried. Um, uh, the uh, president uh, was not cooperative. Uh, the Republicans in the Senate weren't either, which is unfortunate because we all, no matter what our political ideology may be, should be committed to making sure that everybody who can vote can vote. Uh, and so uh, I regret very much that we're going to probably have to come back in, a, with, uh, in another package to try to uh, make that fight. But uh, but uh, we, we ought to make these, uh, these, these, that's a sensible reform and it ought to be permanent. Latasha? And so I'll respond to it as an organizer. I'll be really quick. I think it's really important for us to deal with this inside outside strategy that we want the legislation, but there has to be um, there has to be pressure on the outside. So as students, I've got four things that I think that you could do. One, I think we really got to start preparing people. That part of what happens is we got to help people understand we don't like change. And so helping people to really understand um, that we really, they, we want folks to continue to be engaged in this election cycle. So that's one thing to talk about your, with your friends and your classmates around these different options. Second thing is we, we're going to need more poll workers. Like I said before, We've already seen that in states where we've got a shortage of poll workers. So young people, students can actually volunteer and start really putting themselves in a position so that you can become poll workers. Third thing is we really need to put a lot of pressure, not just on the federal level, but we know that states of the secretary of state actually oversees the election in the state. We need pressure within the states so we can organize and do some advocacy work right now within these states and putting pressure to, to at least expand those vehicles that are there, like absentee ballots, um, absentee voting. Um, and then the fourth thing, I think it's really important for every single student, um, student and person that's listening, you've got to find a political home. This is a moment for you to go in. You've got to, we need all hands on deck. And so I think it's really important that we're having a broader conversation around this. Excellent. Our next question uh, is from Ara. Ara, welcome. Sorry, one second. Um, Take your time. Okay. Great. Oh, nice Hi. to see you. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm glad to still hear that you're seeing Miss Latasha. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you too. Um, so my question is, it honestly leans into what you were talking about with like these considerations we have for voting. So we know that advocates for like reliable reforms on uh, voting and like the accessibility and like going against suppression when it comes to like lines or when it comes to voting machines like that is kind of under the pressure of COVID-19 and like things like that are having to be reformed in the primaries um, as states are like now trying to reassess like how can people vote from home or just those kinds of measures being taken so I'm wondering if do you see these changes like having a lasting legacy on elections and is this in inadvertently making elections more accessible um, just like institutionally from this pandemic? I think it won't if we don't pressure it to. We have to make it be. I mean, I think part of the piece that we got to recognize around democracy is nothing static. Democracy is as it's about the people. As mar as long as the people are engaged, then mm -hmm. that's how democracy is created. So I think it's really important in this process that we literally are putting in reforms to deal with what our immediate niche, if there's a short term and a long term, the short term need. But fundamentally, what we're seeing is we're actually witnessing the fragility of democracy in this country. And so now this is the time for us to really look at these systems to strengthen so that we can, as we move forward, that we really are expanding access to the ballot. And that's a good thing outside of COVID-19. That's a good thing for democracy overall. So thank you. I want to keep my answer short just because of uh -huh. what happened. <laughs> and I, and I, I agree with Latasha, and I, I would I echo what she said too. There's a, this, this is a two-pronged fight. One is a fight at the federal level. Uh, we need to provide the resources to the states during this time if we want to see real change happen immediately. And two, there's the, the state fight. I mean, you know, people sometimes don't pay a lot of attention to the Secretary of State's races in various states. They're incredibly important. And look, um, you know, I don't want to sound too political here, but there are some who feel that the only way they can win elections is by suppressing the vote. Uh, and there has been a very concerted effort at the state level, and now we see it at the federal level, to make it more difficult to vote, uh, even in even in terms of registering to vote, in some states it's easier to, to you know to be able to register to buy a gun uh, than it is to to register to vote. And there's something wrong with that. And Jim, do you see a political, if not consensus, do you see some momentum evolving? 
Yeah, well, I, you know, quite frankly, I, I, had, I had thought that, um, you know, there would have been consensus to be able to provide the resources so that states could do whatever they could to make voting more accessible, you know, in this age of, uh, you know, the coronavirus. Uh, but there was, uh, there, was, there was pushback, which has me nervous. And, you know, I'm not into conspiracy th uh, theories. Uh, we have a president who does that enough for all of us. But, you know, uh, you know I, 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 there, there is a growing uh, fear that, uh, you know, that if this continues, that the president will try to find a way to screw around with the elections. Um, and we all know what the Constitution says. We're all, you know, uh, we all adhere to the constitutional principles, uh, but he may not. Um, and then what do you do then? Um, and given the makeup of the courts, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots to be concerned about our democracy, as Latasha said, and we need to, we, we, we need to make sure that the people can vote and that everybody who's eligible to vote has that right to vote. Our next question is from Lily. Welcome, Lily. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening. My name is Lily Tong, and I am an incoming student at Harvard Kennedy School from Toronto, Canada. Uh, Latasha, I need to take it to your concert after this. Uh, but first of all, I have two questions. So the first one is that um, given that lockdowns have proven to be effective in China, what are the factors preventing municipalities from enacting a lockdown to contain the spread? And the second one is, how does the short-term economic loss during a lockdown measure up to the long-term economic paralysis resulting from prolonged lack of drastic measures? Well, Congressman, can we ask you to take that in terms of kind of working with so many elected officials, I'm sure, in your district? How are you observing them? Well, I mean, you know, one is that uh, some states have taken um, greater measures than, than others. Uh, look, here, here's what we, we need to do, and that goes for governors, presidents, congresspeople, you name it, everybody. We ought to, you know, we got to listen to the scientists, we got to listen to the, uh, the best medical advice. Uh, and we ought to look at what's working in other parts of the world. And I think what we're learning is that, you know, kind of strong measures, uh, you know, up front uh, can help contain this virus, can help flatten the curve that we all hear about every day. And, uh, and so, I mean, I'm, I, you know, and, and some of us have whiplash here because a couple of weeks ago, the president told us this is a hoax. Not that he told us we're fighting a war. Uh, and then the other day he said, I want the churches filled on, on Easter. So, I mean, you know, what he ought to be saying is that I'm going to listen to the best medical advice. I'm going to listen to the science. I'm going to do what is in the interest of the American people to save lives. You, know, you can't save an economy if you don't save lives. And if, uh, if we were to um, somehow, you know, relax some of these restrictions or say, ah, what the, what the heck? You know what? We may find ourselves back in another another moment where we have to lock down again, and this time our economy won't be able to come back. So yeah, this is that's why we're you know we're we're taking strong measures in Congress, the largest relief package in the history I think of our country. We're moving forward, you know, to try to keep people afloat until this passes. But uh, uh, but you know we we need to listen to the science and local and governors. By the way, uh, you know they can decide what they want for their states. It'd be nice if we had a president that you know, would do that and work in conjunction with our governors, but uh, we don't have that luxury right now. Uh, our next student, uh, Latasha, did you want to add anything to that? Okay. Our next student is Kezia, who has a question for both of you. Kezia? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kezia. I'm a senior at the college. Uh, my question is hopefully going to uh, sort of end on a positive note. I'd love to hear what you think is going really well in the political process uh, and maybe share some bright spots that mm. you're seeing or hoping for out of this. Nice. Well, I think, you know, one positive thing is that the Senate voted 97 to nothing on a bill. Um, you can't get 97 senators to agree on what to have for lunch, and yet they came together and, uh, and voted for, quite frankly, you know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you know, an imperfect product. I mean, for me, it doesn't go as far as it should go. It, it doesn't it, it devote enough resources to the most vulnerable in our in our in our country. Uh, for Republicans, you know, you know, it goes too far in a lot of areas. So, uh, the, but I think people know the urgency of this moment and know we don't have a lot of time to screw around. So people came together. Um, the the other thing I'm going to tell you that I, I see is I see the goodness in the American people. Um, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm hearing. You know, in my district, I'm hearing all around the place, people, you know, checking on their neighbors, you know, when they go food shopping, buying food for an elderly neighbor or somebody who they know have a compromised immune system. I mean, 
you know, just checking in on everybody um, and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and supporting our local businesses, buying gift cards and, and, and buying takeout just to, to keep these businesses afloat. So, you know, um, you know, there's some good things happening. Um, but I, uh, but I, but I think we, we don't want to fool ourselves uh, into a false sense of security that uh, the political love fest um, is going to continue um, you know, forever, because, um, you know, some of the things we're going to have to do in terms of investment, you know, may be, may, 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 uh, may be, uh, may incur some, some very, uh, intense debate. Uh, so we have to be prepared for that. Natasha. So I think one, I think the biggest piece, and I always talk about the radical reimagining of America that, you know, I think one of the things is we are right for change right now. You know, change doesn't happen until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. And so I say that because I think in this particular moment, I I'm hoping that this health crisis allow us to really examine that if 32 million people are not without health insurance, that we realize how interdependent we are as human beings, that the health of somebody else actually impacts the health of us, right? And so that we can have a real dialogue and a more open dialogue around healthcare in this country. I'm hoping that in this moment, as we're looking at this crisis, right, that we really and we see the holes in democracy, that what comes out of this is a real commitment for how we've got to strengthen democracy so that we can, in fact, become um, this, this belief around American, the, uh, American idealism becomes real. I believe that we're in this moment now that we're actually, I can tell you, I'm actually helping to teach my, um, my uh, kindergarten child, and I have so much respect for teachers. I think teachers should get paid a billion dollars a year, right? And so my point, I think that, right? I think I'm hoping that in this moment that there is a, a different kind of focus on the, the, the significance and the impact of education in this country. And so I think that there's some core pieces that we're all forced to deal with that we haven't really been dealing with. We just kind of been looking at them as like headlines and newspaper that we're forced to deal with right now that would actually shape a new, a stronger America coming out of this. Well, Jim and Latasha, we can't thank you enough for those uh, words of inspiration to end on, but for your lives that you've led in public service and a commitment to the public good. Um, struck, uh, you're both valued friends. And Latasha, I love your Harvard sweatshirt and your patriotic uh, bill calling us from Atlanta. We and got cool spirit. I, yes. And Jim, I love, I think you're in your dining room. I remember that painting I, yeah. behind I, you. I, picture, I bought that uh, painting in Cuba. I but uh, I wish I could sing like Natasha. I, I would I would open up uh, with a, with a song. But if I did, everybody would tune out. That's uh, right. but can I just say one thing about what Natasha said. I think is very very important. I mean, you know, this is a moment where people have to take this this democracy seriously. Where people really need to be engaged. And right. if we're going to have these discussions on expanding health care and on education and you know and supporting uh, those who are most vulnerable, we need to make sure that you're that we're, we're electing people and elevating people who actually share those values. Um, you know, when, when people complain about, you know, who serves in Congress or who serves in the, in the Senate, I always tell people, you know, people, we didn't get here by accident. People vo vo voted for us or didn't vote for us. And if you didn't vote, then you're part of, and you don't like who's there, you're part of the problem. So exactly. this, is a mo this is a moment to mobilize. Uh, if ever there was a moment, it is now. So happy to be with you. Be safe, everybody. Thank you so much. You've uh, allowed us to begin this uh, Fast Forum, 30-minute dialogue. We'll continue it next week. NBC's Peter Alexander will be our guest, uh, reflecting on his coverage uh, at the White House and the issues um, of the day. But you've start, you both have started us in, in wonderful ways, and we're deeply grateful to you. And, and excellent questions uh, from our students. Blake started us well, and Kezia capped it off. She was an extraordinary chair of the Forum Committee as well. So thank you all. Be safe, everyone. Stay healthy. And thank you so much from here at the Institute of Politics. Have a good night.